Okay, call this meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. Um, try to stay cool this week, you know. Uh, because I remember the days when we didn't have air conditioning and we all got by. So now we do, and we complain if it doesn't work, it's not working. It's, and, uh, okay, Dad, we got it. Okay. That's what we said yesterday. <laughs> so thanks to John and, and his team and Dan for taking it from 85 to 72. Thank you. And Patient Davis has to understand I'm old enough to be his dad. <laughs> so he needs to take elderly advice <laughs> and be respectful. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, Tony, I guess we have somebody special we're going to recognize today. Is that correct? That's not, sir. And it started with the county in 1997. So before John graduated, um, <laughs> he uh, maintenance, he worked outside of here before that, but um, handled our maintenance department. Ted's one of those guys that if there's a problem, he will give him a fix. Electrical, mechanical, um, and been through um, ice storms where we had no power. Working 24 hours, moving generators from place to place to keep our stuff operating. Um, as I can remember my first week of being here, um, and, uh, he's laughing. He, he, I said, I'm not sure what all you do. And he goes, well, I got to change the pumps in this lift station on Saturday. So why don't you come out and help me? So, yeah. The lift station is probably not the best thing you want to start out at. <laughs> yeah, that's how Ted Bird began was taking me to the lift station to, to change the pumps in our testing room facility. So. 27 and a half years with the department. Um, it's one of those individuals that you, you knew he was going to retire and he earned his retirement. It's sad to see him go because of what they do. And know. I want to thank the county for allowing me to do a grow in the time that I've been here. It's been great working for this organization. So, and you're the fourth director, too, by the way. I am the fourth director. He started out with the very first director, um, and then Carrie Hogan and Don Rector and myself. So, so uh, why don't you go on down? We have a little certificate. We'd like to give a little time. down here, Tom. Hold up. I'd like to go up here because it's a fourth push <laughs> So, uh, listen, we appreciate everything you've done, but I haven't thought that I'll get the name of the evening with all your extra well, I, I will say that well, he wanted to retire two years ago. I talked him into two more. I talked him into staying two years. Basically, he did. I So, yes, he did talk to Well, I would imagine. Well, congratulations on your retirement. You don't have much to serve it, you know. <laughs> okay, ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, do one without the extra. <laughs> 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 Skip had a good one. Okay. One more. One, two, three. <laughs> Thanks. 
So we have with us uh, today is Jeannie Phillips Ball, and uh, she's going to do a presentation on uh, on uh, freedom is never free. If you'd like to go to the podium, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Well, I can talk to any veteran. I can talk to any Army brat about their service, where they were deployed, it was not on a sport day. So I'm just going to apologize right now. I'm not a professional speaker by any means. Um, we started Freedom is Never Free about 21 years ago and um, started out as a four hour event. And it is uh, now a three hour, three day event. Uh, we it was a four day event, but it was just way too much for those of us who've gotten older. <laughs> so we knocked it down to three days this past year. Um, Freedom's Number Free is an appreciation celebration for our veterans. And, and after 9 11, um, we started reflecting on who it really should be. It started out specifically to honor our veterans around Veterans Day. And after 9 11, and we watched those videos of those brave men running in as people were running out, you know, we said we need to include our, our first responders because they're our first line of defense. Just because they don't wear a military outfit doesn't mean that they're not serving also. So we include veterans and all first responders. Um, our opening ceremony, first of all, we, we escort a memorial into uh, Lancaster Fairgrounds every year. And we've had Lima Company, Ice of Freedom, we've had the Vietnam Wall. Um, remember our fallen, so many that we've been able to get. Uh, this year we're having Lima Company, Eyes of Freedom again. Um, we also built as crazy as it sounds, um, a World War II memorial that's our own, travels across the country. We also have the Korean memorial, travels across the country, and we have a first responder memorial and one called Small Wars and Conflicts. There's not any other out there um, for Small Wars and Conflicts. Well, what DC calls Small Wars and Conflicts. Uh, if you ask our veterans, if they got shot at, it was a war. <laughs> So, for instance, Korea, our government still calls that a conflict. When anybody associated with the military, you know it was a war. We had people die. My dad served in Korea, and he also served in Vietnam. He spent, goodness, 32 or 34 years in the Army. He raised us like we were in the Army, and that's no joke. <laughs> Every morning at 6 a.m., we had to be out at the flagpole hoisting the flag, loading it before we could get ready for school. Every evening at 6 p.m., no matter what we were doing, we had to be at the flagpole to retrieve the flag, hold it, and then put it in its designated spot, salute it. Then we could carry on. But I wouldn't have it any other way. My dad raised us to, stay, to, to have the same uh, morals and Everything that the military stands for, integrity, honesty, um, like seven of them. Um, so that's my background. Um, the traveling memorial, the World War II memorial that we have, um, like I said, goes around the country. We've been from California all the way to North Carolina. And um, I get an opportunity to speak with our veterans everywhere we go and the whole essence of what they say is just wish I had more time to spend there and when asked do you have any regrets do you have any favorite time any worst time and without a doubt most of them say favorite time is just being being your being a battle buddy to your buddies whether you're female or male they still call you buddy and the worst part, which kind of took me by surprise, was when they retired. 
because they could no longer serve. My dad had been retired for, I mean, 20 some years. And at Desert Storm, he got a call. Well, I always knew when it was the military because my dad would say, sir, yes, sir, after he'd say hello. And that call was to put him on alert. He had a go bag. For those of you who don't know what a go bag is, it's a bag that has everything that you're going to need when you're called to deploy. He went upstairs, he got it, put it by the front door, and I went, no. And he didn't get called up. But he was ready after 20 some years being retired. That's the heart of our veterans. We have um, other memorials that I mentioned, but um, the only reason that we built those is because we wanted to bring these memorials to our veterans here. I had no idea that I'd be traveling with them afterwards. Our World War II veterans, they get so emotional when they come and see the, the World War II memorial that we built, because it's a scaled down version of what's in DC. I don't know if you've ever been to DC and seen the World War II memorial. It is overwhelming. Um, it's so beautiful. The, um, the only difference between what's in DC and the one that we built is because um, I get to say so on a lot of things. The, the sign that goes in front of the Wall of Stars in D.C. says, um, here we mark the price of freedom. And my dad didn't like that. So I took the liberty of changing us in our memorial to um, here marks the price of freedom. So all of the veterans that I've talked to, they'll come up and say, hey, this is beautiful, but you got one thing wrong. And I say, what did I get wrong? And they say, well, that sign. And I say, no, no, we're the ones who got it right. Just ask my dad. So we honor our veterans, our military, first responders, with this um, event that we put on. It's a totally free event to anybody and everybody who wants to come. We don't charge anything. Yes, we have donation containers that people can donate. The Freedom is Never Free, we donate to the memorials that we bring in. Um, we also have a field of heroes. I don't know if you've ever seen it. If you come along Columbus Street and you look to the left at the fairgrounds as you're going by, you'll see all these flags up there. We do our field of heroes different than anybody else. In that, whoever sponsors a flag for their hero or heroes, Paul Jasmin, as I'm sure most of you, if not all of you know, he's our MC for this part. And he reads off the names of the heroes. As he reads them off, those who sponsored those flags will come up and take the flag and then they'll want post it. Very simple, but so emotional. If there's someone who has sponsored a flag and they're not there, we have individuals who will come in their stead and post the flag for them. Sometimes we'll have a veteran who's posted, who has sponsored his own flag because he has nobody to sponsor one for him. And that just gets me. Um, we have um, flag order forms. We don't make any money off of these flags. We get them from the flag lady up in Columbus and um, we charge what she charges us. So I never want it to be said that we're making money off of our bags. That's not true. The other thing is <clears throat> When we bring whatever memorial or memorials that you're bringing to the event, um, sorry, I lost my dream of thought. I think it's the age. <laughs> but when we bring these memorials, we escort them into fairgrounds. 
Um, our escort route is Route 33 coming from Hawking. And then we come take the Broad Street exit, come straight up Broad Street, right into Fairgrounds. The first, the first, I don't know, two to five years that we were bringing memorials, the streets would be lined with people <coughs> waving their flags. And it was absolutely beautiful, touching, and the veterans loved it. Last year, when we brought the memorial through, I can count on one hand the number of people on the streets who welcome the memorial and these veterans in. It was very heartbreaking. In fact, I had one veteran's wife. She has been deceased, but she wanted to be in the escort for the first time because she wanted to see what it was like. We got to the fairgrounds and she says, Jeannie, where are all the people? I thought, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, they're working on trying to explain. Um, but the fact of the matter is, if they could come out 20 years ago and loads and loads of people on the street, I don't know why they can't come out now. So, one of the reasons that I'm here is to tell you about Freedom is Never Free. And the other one is to tell you about what our needs are. Um, after the escort, everyone who will, who can, we ask that they stay and help us unload the memorial and set it up. And almost no control. And a handful of veterans that are staying to help. And um, they're up in age, and it's difficult for them. Um, we have a few people that um, aren't with Freedom Summer Free, but they'll stay in health. The World War II Memorial, we're tossing it around if, if we're going to bring that this year or not. Um, I love that memorial, but it's so, the pieces are so heavy. And it's just very difficult if we don't have 25 or more people just to unload that and set it up. <clears throat> After the escort, we have the opening ceremony. This year, it's October 31st, November 1st, November 2nd. We always try to have it the first weekend in November. When we first started out, it was the second weekend in November, but there were so many things going on after Veterans Day. People had to choose what they were going to go and attend. So we were asked to move it, and we did. Um, the opening ceremony, first thing that happens is the Field of Heroes and the Post New Colors. Second thing that happens is um, we go up to the Ed Sands building and we have a pinning ceremony. Hospice of Fairfield County conducts a pinning ceremony and um, pins all of those who have served our country. After that, we have a silent drill for, um, and they do their little stuff, a little bit stuff with the guns, and it's pretty impressive. I love it. Um, we have some guest speakers and. Afterwards, everything is open the whole weekend. One of the things that we need is we need volunteers, volunteers for a lot of stuff. First thing is to unload and set up memorials. Second thing is um, we need donations. And we're a 501c3. And if it wasn't for the memorials and traveling across the country with those, we wouldn't be able to bring this event. So, so Jeannie, uh, I, you know, it, it, as you mentioned, it was a little disappointing that the Brain Bridge, or as the memorial is coming into town, it's you're not seeing more flags. 
it, it, is it because people don't huddle? That could be. I still, after 20 some years, I, I 21 years, I still have people saying, I've never heard of this before. Yeah. You know, so I think a lot of it is that people don't know. So, and, and we'll do our part to try to get the word out because I think this is so important. And so, again, I think we, we need to be helpful in that regard. So, we'll do what we can to get the word out. You know, I, I've attended these events, I think they're amazing, absolutely amazing. And uh, you know, patriotism in this country isn't what it once was, but it, uh, we need to get back there, right? I agree. Yeah. You know, so, uh, one question, you know, you did the flag um, ceremony with your father morning and night. Did he ever make you do KP duty? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Did he ever make you do KP duty? <laughs> yes. No, you I, military, I understand, and I'm sure you do as well. Yeah, I had KP duty quite a lot. We used to um, used to put on a dinner. It wasn't <laughs> just for those being honored. It was for everybody, anybody who came. And... COVID kind of take that aside. And I'm actually glad <laughs> because it's a lot of work fixing all that food and you know right. all that. But to be fair, I would just go in the kitchen and say, hey, how's it going? And the other ladies would be, you know, because they'd be so hot. And um, but they did a fantastic job. So my KP duty really pretty much consisted of saying, Hi, I need anything, how you doing? Uh, they, they did all the work. Well, we certainly get this on the county's website. And we'll, do, we'll do everything. I think Jeff Barron's is on, uh, on with us today, hopefully. And, you know, the, the Blank Straples Gazette can do something for that regard, hopefully. Yeah, we've had um, Jeff do some articles in the past, not every year, but um, he always does one job. Um, I wanted to tell you too, we have a USO style dance on Friday, this year, November 1st. You can come dressed in any era that you like, which I love it because we've had World War II outfits, we've had um, these, the 70s, <laughs> uh, you name it. To come. We've, we've had, when, when Freedom of Free first started out, we did have um, quite a few volunteers. But I'll just put it this way. We had a gentleman last year who was part of our um, organization. He said, I just want to help. I said, okay. And he would fill in at the, one of the tables that we had. And I said, hey, where's Phil? This year at our meeting, they said, he said you worked him too hard. <laughs> I'm just not going with that. And I, I brought my brain. How oh, I work him too hard? And one of the guys said, oh, he just seen an excuse. Well, now I'm going to be wondering how hard I, I actually work them. Um, but like I said, we have very few people um, who help out with Freedom's Number Free. And I know I've had people on the board say, you know, when you talk to people, tell them we need donations, which we do. But it's more important to me getting volunteers to load and unload the memorials and then the events over. Take them down, load them. It's, it's a lot of work. So, so where do we find where we can donate to your organization? Where do, where do we find that? So, our website is freedomsneverfree.com. Okay. okay. We also have a Facebook. Um, and you can call me. Yeah, I've been called crazy for putting my personal phone number out there. No. <laughs> but I want to carry two phones. Yeah, I just really appreciate all the work that you do. Clearly, it's a passion for you, and uh, you know, keeping the the memories of all the folks from all around, but in particular Fairfield County that have served our country, is a, a great cause. So, thank you, Claudia. Yeah. Commissioner Davis. No questions. Just send our sincere appreciation. Thank you. Well, we do what we do. Doesn't put so many others down part freedom. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Jeannie, yeah. I did make some copies okay. of the flyer and I've shared them in the room. And um, myself and uh, the department heads are volunteering on uh, the 31st to help Jeannie uh, get some things set up. So if others would like to join us, that'd be greatly appreciated. That would be really appreciated so much.
So we, we would like to see that uh, parade route, if you will, kind of combined with flags as, as commission. That would be amazing. And people, you know, just flag. Yeah. Right. Excuse me. I will have um, Helen, the Vietnam veteran's wife, I'll have her come in the escort again. If she's physically able, she's had some medical issues. If she can, we will have her there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. all of you. Thank you for everything you did. Great. Uh, so, uh, Jeff, I understand you're going to tell us about uh, stop loss. So we have somebody that's joining us virtually. Is that correct? That is correct. I look really big on that screen. <laughs> that was the goal. Good to talk today. Right. Um, good, uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, we're here to talk about our internal stop loss pool associated with our health benefit plan. Um, we were very thankful um, that uh, last year you um, gave you a go ahead to create the stop loss pool. And today joining us is uh, Kate Hubin of NFP and uh, Jim Dustin. And we're going to give you a brief presentation about a proposal to expand what we're doing with our stop loss pool uh, and to give you some insights of what we did last year uh, with the So, Kate, would you like to start? Yes, um, Jim Dustin is joining us today, who's the managing director of NFP, um, and Susan Justovic, who's also um, one of your consultants on the Fairfield team. And I just want to thank you so much for letting us join you today. Um, we're going to walk through some slides, and um, then we can have a discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Jim Dustin. Can you hear Can Jim? You hear? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Morning, everybody. Good morning. So we're going to walk you through uh, just a, a quick slide presentation uh, around expanding uh, the stop loss pool. Okay, if you want to flip to the next slide. So just by way of background, uh, the pool was created in 2022 for the 2023 plan year. Uh, we were able to achieve savings of roughly $464,000 by doing so. And essentially, what the stop loss pool is designed to do is it, it does, it's designed to allow the, the county to take some additional risk uh, while essentially creating an opportunity to be able to maintain a stop loss level that erodes over time yet the other thing that it allows to do is it allows you to expand under regionalization guidelines 9833 of the ohio revised code you can expand that pool if you so choose to other public entities um, in and around fairfield county so uh, Jim, maybe preliminarily uh, just as a refresher stop loss is a layer of essentially insurance that we take the risk for, and we opted to take the risk from $250,000 in our, our program, our self-funded insurance program, up to $500,000. Previously, what we were doing was going out on the open market and purchasing another layer of insurance from an outside company for that $250,000 to $500,000 layer. And um, I think Kate knows this, and obviously Jim does too, that was costing us a significant amount of time every year to do that. We may not hit that stop loss layer, but essentially we were paying premiums to an insurance company. And as we all know, we may never use our auto insurance. We may never use our home insurance, but we're still paying that premium over those. And we'd have to get it back. Can I ask a question sure. on this slide? 
I, I, in my mind, I can think of a couple of different ways you would calculate how much you saved. And I was just curious what calculation was used to derive the 464.2 for 2020. So the 464 was um, a part of what we paid ourselves for the, those premiums. We were able to retain that money even after we paid. Now, as we all know, we had a pretty significant year last year in claims, and we did hit stop loss uh, uh, for many of those claims. Even after we calculated the amount of premium we would need to pay ourselves, we were able to retain 464000 If we were paying that outside... The and that's why I asked the question, because I, I assumed that the 464 was the net number. We paid ourselves X amount in premium, Correct. and we only paid out Y amount, and Z is the 464. But the if, if we calculated that on the basis of what we would have paid on the open market, I assume the 464 would be a higher number. Yes. and. And also, um, when we're looking at, we didn't we didn't charge ourselves charge ourselves any more for the renewal this year. If we had gone out on the open market, I think we would have been looking at at least a fourteen percent increase to what we had already paid ourselves. Thank so, you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Kate, you can move that slide. So this is a graphical representation of the way the stop loss pool works. As Jeff indicated, uh, the county purchases stop loss from an outside stop loss carrier uh, at a level of 500,000. Uh, the internal level, the county's level is at 250,000. So the difference is essentially the pool. Um, and the county pays itself premiums, as Jeff indicated, uh, that are actuarially based to the level of 250,000, the savings difference comes in two places. It comes from the fact that we pay at a level of 500,000, which is significantly lower on the open market than 250. Um, and then we also have the pool to manage and that pool is managed to essentially a break even. So if you think about it in theory, uh, when you self-insured originally, the idea was to stop paying an insurance company margin or, or profit for losses that are expected and carried. The same principle applies here. Uh, we're doing essentially the same thing for stop loss. So we're further insulating the county from, you know, the higher cost of, of stop loss premiums as they go up each year. Under the future state, uh again the same principles apply we would continue to buy at five hundred thousand, but the county has the opportunity to add other public entities that are self-insured uh throughout the state if it so chooses but generally speaking in and around fairfield county um and basically uh, the process works this way um and again the orc says that you can operate a pool uh, for the benefit of yourselves and others, um, but you have to break even over time. The law also states that you can charge uh, essentially an administrative fee for the burden of carrying the risk and the burden of doing the administrative work to manage these types of pools. Um, but essentially, it would work this way. Uh, premiums, if we if we reach out to public entities that are self-funded and want to join, those premiums would be paid to Fairfield County. The county would actually bill those entities for that premium, uh, and that would then fund the stop loss pool. So each entity would have its own actually supported, actuarially supported rate structure uh, that is developed in-house by NFP and then is approved by the management committee uh, risk committee of Fairfield County. Alongside of that, in addition to the premiums, a management fee is paid to the county as well. So it creates essentially uh, another revenue stream to cover the expenses of running the pool and or expenses of running the plan. Uh, and, and we submit those entities as they come through um for approval so there's two levels of due diligence one is the actuarial support around the rate structures the second is the risk committee's approval because the risk committee ultimately can decide to approve or deny any entity that wants to join 
Um, all of the underwriting is done based on demographics, risk profile, and large claims, uh, and follows a standard underwriting guidelines that, that are what we would consider industry accepted principles. Uh, in this scenario, we would recommend that you only have a certain number of levels to limit the administrative burden of managing the process. So we have recommended a $75,000 specific level, $100,000 specific level, 150 and your current 250K stop loss. So essentially four stop loss levels within the pool that other entities may choose to uh, look at and use. There are two benefits <clears throat> to uh, a smaller entity. One is the fact that they are able to buy in a larger pool from an entity uh, that essentially has a nonprofit goal. That's the first and foremost. The second is their ability to use the county essentially as another vendor uh, in their open negotiations. So even though they may not choose to join, the county provides a benefit in the fact that they've got another carrier to review and use uh, in their negotiating leverage. So we believe that provides some political capital to smaller, uh, for the county to smaller entities. Now, I'll stop there. Um, I ask a question on the prior slide. The first bullet point there is the goal being to break even. I just had a couple questions about that. One, does break even mean that the expectation would be that the amount paid in premiums by the other entities would be distributed in losses. Yes. Uh, so let me just clarify a couple of things. The county has the right to retain premiums or reserves in that pool to sustain it over time. So it it's not specifically uh, essentially a cash out every year. If, if that makes sense, meaning you're not going to, if, if you had a profit of a half a million dollars in 2025, you would not have to distribute that back to the entities. It can be held in trust for future years uh, because you're not going to break even every year. Uh, you may have a year where you have a surplus. You may have a year where you have a deficit. As long as you're running an actuarially accepted principles and reasonable guidelines, uh, typically 90 to 120 days of reserves, you can keep those funds in the pool to offset future increases. Again, if, if you were to have huge surpluses, uh, the state auditors may come back and ask you to push that money back into the plan. You can do that one of two ways. You could do it in terms of a premium holiday, or you could actually just create a refund. Um, or uh, actually a third way would be to just lower the increases over time. So I, I want to stay with this goal to break even, and I understand your description of how that break even occurs. But w when you when you establish the premium in this situation, you're looking back, let's say, at X number of years of history from the applicant or person that or entity we're interested in. and and. And let's just say that over the last five years, they've averaged what would be a $500,000 a year loss on this. So we're going to charge them a $500,000 premium so that, you know, we're trying to break even according to bullet point number one. But it, it, isn't there any kind of a, a conservatism that's added to that actuarial calculation where some assumption is, is made kind of above the curve, so to speak? So in other words, if their history is $500,000 in losses, well, we wouldn't set the premium at four ninety nine, dollars And I think 501 is probably not enough either. So can you tell us a little bit about that process? Yeah. So again, it goes, it goes into using an actuarial uh, calculation to develop premiums. In, in every actuarial calculation that I've ever seen, we generally include a safe harbor provision. Um, and you would find those same safe, har safe harbor provisions in any commercial carrier as well. Um, it accounts for not only what could occur or, to your point, conservatism, um, but it also allows for, um, you know, actuarial missteps, if you will, right? Um, you're not always going to get it 100% accurate. 
uh, we want to build a safe and sustainable pool uh, that has longevity over time. And that's the goal. So you would typically see five to 10% in safe harbor. And, and the goal of this would be that um, not only is it beneficial in providing stability for Fairfield County, it's also providing that stability uh, to a rate structure. Just, um, people are finding now in relation to stop loss and, um, and other uh, access layers of insurance that companies are becoming very risk averse. Um, we have a lot of, uh, in, especially in, in liability insurance, separate and aside from health insurance, uh, folks are risk averse to insure buildings, folks are risk averse to insure, insure law enforcement activities, and those layers of excess coverage um, are becoming more and more expensive. Just Go ahead, Kate. The only thing I was going to add is that we saw that um, commissioners last year when we had our 500,000 stop loss renewed, even though we hadn't breached any 500,000 layer, they still gave us, uh, you know, initially before we negotiated down, they still gave us like a 15% renewal, even though we had never talked about it. So that, you know, goes to Jeff's point about it, it is a hard market out there in the open market. So, uh one comment and then a couple more questions, if I might. One, if I were writing bullet number one, I'm not sure I would say that my goal is to break even. <laughs> but unless we're like legally required to say that, then okay. The other cool point I wanted to make is it, I'm I'm seeing three potential revenue positive outgrowths from this. One, in that situation where the premiums exceed the loss, there would be some, some money there, so to speak. The management fee, call that five points, looks like a potential uh, source of revenue. The third thing, and I, I'm not 100% sure on this, but the, the monies that would be on deposit in what I'll call the stop loss fund, I think those monies are earning interest, and I think that interest might be going to the general fund. Is that? Does anybody know if I'm? If that's true, I think you're right. You're you're correct. If if you're holding reserves and you've got some interest-bearing vehicle, uh, that money would be considered, you know, funds to the general fund or, you know, funds to the insurance fund if if that's where you want to keep it. So so let's say that that that. I'm seeing three possible revenue sources. Premiums over loss possible could go the other way too. Administrative fee and potentially some interest component back to the general fund. And the, and the, the other possible revenue stream, I don't know if we want to call it revenue, is the savings of maintaining the stop loss insurance for ourselves, the stability of that. If we had not done this last year, we would have potentially paid another $140,000 to an insurance company and not received that back. And, and that would have been just an increase uh, to, to the program going. I, I have more questions, but I want you to be able to get through your presentation. Okay. Sure. And, and in this last slide, um, again, we, we believe considerations and or opportunities um to be the following one it, it does increase your buying power uh, stop loss is true risk uh insurance so the larger an entity you become the more premium that is generated the more predictable uh those losses become uh, it also gives you increased buying power in the market meaning uh, if that pool grows to three million five million that is an attractive risk for any carrier which will bring more carriers to the market um, and allow you to leverage that as uh, in the negotiation process. As you indicated, you've got additional operating revenue streams through the management fees, potential interest, um, and obviously the savings from being able to maintain a risk level that is increasingly difficult to maintain and hold, and hold cost structures for. Um, we believe that it also gives you political capital with other entities and synergies. 
uh, with other public entities to be able to collaborate and, and do this uh, as a benefit for everyone. And you also de-risk your own program by adding these entities and growing that pool as we talked about. So I'll stop there before next steps and allow questions. Any additional questions? Yeah, um, if I might. So uh, Jeff Porter and I had a chance to visit briefly earlier this morning to go over some of these issues. And one of the questions I asked him and I wanted to, to get the question in front of you folks is, is let's call the stop loss fund a, a silo within a portfolio of health insurance products that, that we currently have, so to speak. I, I know that language wasn't perfect, but you, you know what I'm saying. The, the, if you have a discussion about opening the stop loss fund up to other entities, I can't imagine that you had that discussion with no discussion of the concept of opening up the whole portfolio to other entities. And I wanted to hear if that discussion came up and, and what that discussion was. Yeah, for Kate, do you want to take that one? Yes, um, two things. I, I think that um, we have been active and obviously we, we manage this for other counties. And we thought that in terms of um, we wanted to start with opening up the stop loss pool before we thought about expanding to other um, lines of coverage or the entire medical plan. We just thought that, and not that that's not on the table, but we just thought that this might be a first step to get everyone comfortable with having other entities. And, and, and I'm not advocating opening up those other products. Um, but I'm encouraged to know that, that that thought or that discussion or that concept is in play here. I guess what I'm getting to is, you know, if you start down a particular path on a, on a policy decision, you're, you're going to want to know kind of where that path ends and i guess that's a, a little bit of a broad question but that's that's a curiosity i have right now i get what it looks like to begin this process what do you see as a as a, a medium or in range scenario where we end up here so i, I would say oh. go ahead jim so I, I would say it's really up to the county to determine its its own comfort level with expansion of any of these programs. You, you certainly have ORC approval to do what we term regionalization, um, and that can take many forms um, within the healthcare program. So as Kate indicated, we operate a number of these programs throughout the state. Uh, and they all have varying levels of, you know, sort of downline uh, possibilities uh, from what you're considering today, which is the stop loss pool, all the way to offering full benefits and coverage uh, and risk, you know, to other smaller entities um, as a way to build and offset your own internal cost structures. So there's no right or wrong answer. And from my perspective the progression ends ends at full coverage but it doesn't doesn't have to be where you where you go you could certainly open it up and this is where you're comfortable and it works for you uh, there's no hard hard answer there regionalization is something that can be done and we've seen it we've been a part of it before um and, you know, Lake County, they, they've got a, a more uh, a program up there that does take in other entities for uh, health insurance and coverage. Um, it becomes the question, and I guess the answer to your question is, what will do we have to do that? What, what, what is our thought process in that? And I would say that ultimately, um, we would have to take a look at it from a risk perspective. What risk is there? 
last question I have for today. One, I'm very interested in this entire discussion and probably say absolutely go forward already. But, but the other question I had is, is, is let, let's say you were advocating that we sell candy bars. You're not, you're advocating that we open up and stop lost money. But if you were advocating that we sell candy bars, you would probably tell us that you think X number of people might like to buy candy bars because you're trying to get us to sell them. In that concept, do you have a, a, a any feel for the market in terms of whether there are entities who would be uh, who who would benefit from joining the stop loss that that we should be in communication with, or perhaps already are? I don't know. I can't speak to who we've been in contact with, but um, I can tell you there are a number of consortiums throughout the state, both in government entities and schools. So the concept is not new. I can also tell you that there are a lot of very poorly run consortiums um, throughout the state for a number of reasons. It could be they were started a long time ago and did not adapt with the changing conditions in the market. Um, some are very, what I would call, heavy-handed in terms of the way they operate, uh, and that makes them unattractive over time. Uh, we think, at least from a market intelligence perspective, in central Ohio, there are a couple of uh, government consortiums that may break apart because, frankly, their rule structure doesn't fit with the current organizational profiles of those entities. If they do break apart, um, it's likely that, you know, this program could have new new opportunities for discussion with those entities. Um, that's that's what I can say about the market intelligence. There, there are a lot of entities around the state of Ohio that I've talked to about you know, would you ever be interested in this? And and everyone seemed very enthusiastic about having an alternative market for their stop loss purchasing. From the word go, when do we when if we say yes, we like this idea, would it be operational then in twenty five? Five. Yeah, it Correct. would be the, it would be for the twenty five policy year. We're operational now with the internal. We have the risk committee, we have quarterly meetings, and we also, you know, make our payments and do everything uh, by our bylaws. So we're operational. It's a matter of opening it up, setting up MOUs and contracts and, and going forward. We would be obviously working with the actuaries at NFP and the team uh, to so the discussion right now is to actually offer this within the county and not expand it beyond that. Is that my understanding? We're already, we're already doing it now that way. Okay. This would be expanding it to um, other local um, government entities um, and um, going through a process of evaluating their claim structure, assessing the risk of bringing them into a soft loss arrangement, and then setting an adequate premium to cover their potential losses and other, other government entities anywhere uh, it would be within the state of ohio so what do you need from us to move forward um at this point we would, we would need a, a thumbs up from the commissioners on that I'm, I'm i'm way in favor of this concept and and want us to proceed um accordingly i think in terms of you folks that are working on this, you certainly want to keep your eyes on the immediate question of expanding our access to our stop loss pool for fun. Um, but every once in a while, I'd lift your chin up and, and look down the road in terms of what possible next steps would be logical and, and make sense from a, a risk reward standpoint for us to participate in. Well, I would just say that we are very. Thankful, I know many years ago, I think it was 2017 and 16, when we considering what we were going to do with our health insurance. I, I for one, was advocating we move into another consortium, and the commissioners said, let's, let's go it on our. So, uh, you know, that was the start of this, and that was the vision that pushed us to, to do what we're doing today. So, thank you. So, when I was talking about stop loss within the county, I was referring to. 
Oh yeah, I mean definitely we we can we can look at what they're doing um, and see if there's an, a, you know, an opportunity there for them um, and our other municipalities um, and other other groups. And we'll come back also for approval when we go through that due diligence to talk about the entities that are um, viable. Yep. Thank you. Thank you both for being on with us today. Thanks a lot, everybody. And I don't know Thank who, you. Don't, Thank one you. More, one more thought, if I might. I don't know who initiated this discussion or came up with this idea or if it was some sort of group think or whatever, but from whatever vantage point this idea came up, I thank the person or the process that resulted in this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I believe it was a nice collaboration amongst yeah. all parties. And, so, and that sounds like it was Jim's idea. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> and one thing about um, Fairfield County and Jeff, though, is that a lot of um, public entity clients get interested in doing innovative things, but they have a hard time moving the ball down the field. And Jeff, and I've said this before at other meetings, he does advance the ball and brings it to you for your feedback. And so that helps us do our jobs a lot better. Great. Thank you. Alex. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Have a good day. Jeff, moving on to uh, personnel policy. Yeah, we'll keep this pass it down. You guys might already have it. Uh, but we'll try to keep this short. I know insurance and policies are usually not the most scintillating topics uh, to go through, but we have a double whammy today. We're going to get through it. Uh, try to get through it quickly. As you guys all know. We have a personnel policy manual. We were very fortunate in the fact that um, the model personnel policy manual for the state of Ohio was uh, one of the people that helped draft that is our own county administrator. Um, she helped draft the initial award-winning policy manual that we based ours off of. And um, we, uh, in order to keep it relevant, updated every year or even more frequently than that we've had times that we've updated it more than once um, this year it's pretty significant updates that we've run through um, because of some changes to federal law state law and also um, um, other things that we needed to to add in uh, we've had some really good feedback and collaboration with the auditors payroll staff which we appreciate um, in relation to some of these policies the prosecutor's office and also we've gotten and solicited feedback from uh, department heads and things of that nature so that we've had uh, folks um, providing us information to keep the policy manual relevant to our employees and also to make sure that it's doing what we need it to do as an employer. So uh, we're gonna run through really quickly. You'll see section one, there are some changes to mobile devices and information. This is all done to reflect that we've changed our our um, some of our IT structure from the perspective of having um, multi-factor authentication and um, just some some of the need to update terminology associated with technology. So we've gone through and updated that. Um, we've also uh, done a couple of changes to public records policy in the ways that we respond to records requests because. People aren't using compact disks or floppy disks anymore, and some of that language was still in there. So we had to take some of that out um, as to the ways that we were responding to those. Uh, workplace safety, we've just updated where people can file uh, and find the workplace injury reporting packet. Uh, section four is the credit and vendor cards policy. This was a very collaborative effort that went on between auditors, office, uh, Bev Hoskinson, the prosecutor's office, Amy Brown Thompson, to update our credit card policy to make reflective of state law. It's expanded the uses of credit cards from the very small number of enumerated uses that we can use credit cards for to allow for uh, proper public purpose usage and um, allow people to do their jobs. Many things nowadays require you to pay with a credit card. Uh, so uh, we're, we're moving along with the times. Uh, weather emergency and closure uh, facilities, we've been improving 
that uh, to um, make sure that people know how to access the information for closing a facility or um, be moving to remote work on a given day if there's an emergency. Uh, we did some performance evaluation adjustment to move that date to when they're due to December 15th. We got some feedback from folks that the November date was causing people some problems to get it to meet those goals. We went there and we made that change. Um, alcohol and drug abuse. So Ohio's marijuana law has changed, as we all know. We made some changes to our policy to make it reflective. Big takeaway from this is this. Alcohol has been legal since prohibition. You can't come to work drunk. And even if marijuana is legal, you can't come to work hot. So that's the basics of the marijuana. Just have to keep that in mind. We are a drug-free workplace. Don't come to work impaired. That's, that's very simple. Um, county, uh, we had some changes to uh, the uh, motor vehicle because of distracted driving, the new law about texting. We wanted to make sure that that was reflected, that you aren't supposed to be using your phone while you're behind the, the uh, wheel of your vehicle. Uh, Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, there may have been some questions about this. ADA didn't really consider pregnancy something that would have the Americans with disabilities act, something that would be accommodated. However, during pregnancy, there can be conditions that happen to pregnant moms. So um, essentially, the new law says you have to make reasonable accommodation for those things that may happen during pregnancy. And we want to make sure that we're taking care of our folks. Vacation, um, we've made a change to allow a certain amount of vacation to be earned by part-time folks. Um, this is part of our transit transition uh, to make sure that we are we're trying to keep things as the same as possible for everybody across the board. Um, and we also are updating the vacation leave conversion, which is allowing people to cash out vacation leave. Uh, we're allowing people to do that once per calendar year, rather than just having a set time during the year that people can take that conversion. We're allowing people to individualize based on their need because we have some folks down in law enforcement that approve, approve vacation quite a bit and actually don't um, get to use it before they get reached the maximum. So we're kind of allowing people to have a little bit of flexibility in that program. Uh, we made some changes to leaves with absence without pay and um, the impacts that disability insurance may or may not have on particular leave. Uh, EAP, uh, we just updated those sections, including FML and things like that, directing people to the My Mobile Wallet card, which is the program that you have on your phone, and making sure that people know you can get all of your information there and find it when it's needed. Uh, we clarified some uh, language related to payouts on separation of service, and then we also updated uh, Addendum A to the compensated, which is Addendum A policy manual of compensation planning policies. We've made some changes in the past of eliminating some um, lower ranges to keep the wages uh, up to the standards that we need to. And uh, the one change that we were making was the fact that um, there's a certain uh, pay structure associated with promotions to different ranges. And so we needed to make that reflective of the fact that those lower rank, a couple of those lower ranges are now gone. So we had to make that change. Uh, are there any questions? Appreciate all your work on this. Thank you. It's more than me. Got a whole team. Appreciate Thank all you. Everybody. All the work on this. The legal folks. April folks. Everybody. You know, I appreciate all your work on this as well as our health <laughs> terms. Thank you. We uh, continue to improve what we have. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anything on legal? I think you need to report. Yeah. So uh, we've reached the point of our meeting where we allow public comment. So if you wish to make public comment, please uh, approach the podium, give your name and address, and it is limited to three minutes. Good morning. I'm glad to be here this morning. And uh, 
I just feel that uh, so many decisions have to be made in this uh, room, people here, and those of you in authority. You need to look for all the information you can, I'm sure. And I pray that you continue to look for a higher being, such as our Lord Jesus Christ, be that. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing us to meet here this morning, to have this time to see the working of the commissioners and their efforts. And we pray that you give them special insight and those people around the room that make other decisions that affect each of us as citizens of this county. Help us, Lord, to make the right decisions because it's a very difficult position to be in. You can be right and still be wrong. So help them, Lord, to make those decisions for the people of this county. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Who would like to be next? Good morning. We thought you might appreciate just one big mouth, but we'd like to show that we're all on the same page. Those of us who have been active with Citizens for Fairfields continue to learn more and more about the process um, of going before the Ohio Power Siding Board, um, particularly about the project with Eastern Cottontail. We're very pleased we have a lot of people in our community who are writing letters already to the Ohio Power Siding Board ex expressing their concern about the project. Um, first of all, we would like very much to thank the commissioners for including Eastern Cottontail project in the Fairfield County exclusionary zone. So if I may, thank you. But what is not commonly understood is that Senate Bill 52 says that after such a geographic geographic exclusionary zone for a general area is created. A process is then in effect which a specific solar company can follow. Once that specific project is proposed by a solar company, which was done by the recent public hearing for Eastern Cottontail, the county commissioners must in effect implement the geographical exclusionary zone by specifically prohibiting the specific project in a specific resolution. This resolution must be adopted by the commissioners within 90 days of the public hearing that is held under section 303.61 of Senate Bill 52. The relevant provision regarding the needed resolution under Senate Bill 52 is subsection one of section 303.62. I'll give you copies of this section when I finish here in a second. The public hearing for Eastern Cottontail was on Wednesday, May 29th, 2024. I request that the commissioners promptly adopt a resolution pursuant to subsection one of section 303.62 of the Senate Bill 52, prohibiting the Eastern Cottontail project proposed at the public meeting, I'm sorry, public hearing on May 29th, 2024. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, my name is Melissa Connor and I live at 7710 Cattail Road. Thank you for your time. I'd like to be next. The folks from Citizens for Fairfield, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, your presentation format today is very, very much appreciated. I was just counting, I think there was maybe 12 or 13 of you up there standing there, and I was doing the math in my head in three minutes each. Uh, you could have dig this up for 40 minutes. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to say thank you.
they also really needed to stand up. Stand <laughs> <laughs> it out. Is, is there anyone else who would like to make public comment this time? Seeing none, moving on. I'd asked for a legal co uh, comment earlier, but nothing. So let's move on to <laughs> let's, let's move on to uh, county administration. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so um, recently, you all had a presentation from the Heart and Safety Committee on the Avive AEDs. Um, this is a new AED product which does connect to nine one one and allows for those resources to be shared within the community. Uh, we were able to, um, uh, with the help of Garrett Levins at EMA, uh, put together a plan so that we would be purchasing 16 units of the new Avive, and uh, those would be replacing older non-911 connected units in county buildings, and we're using ARP funds to do that particular project. Uh, the units that we have that we are replacing, they are still usable and functional. And we are looking to donate those to other public and entities in the county that do not have uh, an AED. Don, you want to add to that? Well, just that also we've met as a community our minimum to to incorporate that 911 dispatching. So that uh, will be part of this as we roll out ours, as well as others in the communities that these can go to need as it arises. Questions? Okay. You know, uh, AEDs, they can. Continually to evolve. I guess uh, this unit uh, allows when there's a 911 uh, call that you would receive notification. The AED that. would actually tell you where to take it. So that's so, and you know, that could be somebody on the third floor from so maybe one on the first floor uh, or next door. Or next door. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. You know, I, when I was on the you know, fire service, I watched the uh, uh, white packs, the ventilators, hard monitors uh, fall, uh, if you will. The first one we bought was about eight thousand dollars, and now they're about forty thousand dollars or more. In little little tiny boxes, but the, the, these uh, these can save lives. So it's pretty important. I think we fly them on drones next. That's my idea. That's your idea. Okay. All right. Uh, the review packet does contain a list of administrative approvals, and the purchase of the AED will be accomplished via administrative approval uh, today. There are 16 resolutions on the agenda for the regular voting meeting. Two there that I will highlight for you. Uh, we do have an approval of um, a lease renewal agreement with New Horizons Mental Health Services for the Fairfield Center. We have previously had a one-year lease. This will be um, uh, securing a three-year lease there with them. Appreciate John and his work there. Else on that, John? Very good. And then lastly, uh, last resolution I'll highlight for you, there is a resolution establishing discounted water and sewer rates. It's a pilot program that Tony is implementing uh, that would be for folks 65 and older um, at veteran status or meeting the homestead exemption criteria. Tony, what do you want to share on that? The higher price code allows us to achieve the discounted rate for 65 and older um, income based. So we're going to pilot it. And uh, set it up for there. And if some things change, I know they're looking at some things at the state level with that guidance. Maybe be able to expand it, but getting a 10% discount to uh, seniors and veterans income based right now. So when you say highlight it, does that mean like you're going to test it? Uh, put it out there for everybody that meets the criteria. We're putting it out there for everybody that meets the criteria, but we can adjust the criteria um, in the future. Right now, we're kind of tied by a higher advice code with some of the things we can do, um, and we're doing it by the homestead exemption. Um, it's it's easy. They, the auditor's office has that already set up. Um, things go, and we could expand it outside of that, but they have to have the income criteria in 60 bucks. So the folks that would possibly qualify would make, have to make application to 
do that. Right. They would do an application to us, um, which may add some people that doesn't don't know that they would qualify for homestead, but many of the homestead people would um, definitely qualify for ours right away. All right, thank you. Uh, no budget sure, I just, oh, sorry. I, I'm not sure where this idea emanated from. Um, I, my vantage point, it came from you. Um, I, I just think it's a concept, good idea, and I'm obviously in favor of it, and look forward to a rear view mirror, so to speak. I want to look back and see, okay, what happened here. Um, um, it was at our budget hearing where we talked about it, um, but um, as you've talked many times, that there's there's some seniors that are nervous about staying in their houses, on, either on the taxes side, whatever. Um, we just felt like it might be an opportunity for us to assist in that. Okay, Bennett, calendar review and invitations received, please. Under calendar review and invitations received, we received an invitation to the Eastern Cottontail Solar Second Public Information Meeting. That'll be on Tuesday, July 2nd at 5 p.m. at the Liberty Center. Under correspondence, the Bottoms Up Diaper Bank June 2024 newsletter, a press release from the Office of the County Auditor dated June 12th titled Auditor's Office Releases Weights and Measures Fair Scales Certification Video. Columbus Dispatch article titled Intel in Ohio Meet Holly Maddie, the woman prepared preparing Licking County for the future. <laughs> A memo from Dr. Carrie Brown, County Auditor from June 13th, subjects internal controls, business incentives, and monitoring. Profile of Fairfield County. Lancaster Eagle Gazette article titled Fairfield County Commissioners Honor Liberty Union State Championship Softball Team from June 12th. The Fairfield DD June 2024 Imagine Newsletter. The Fairfield County Auditors Wins of the Week. Correspondence regarding industrial solar projects and a list of county projects under the one-time strategic community investments. Great. Thank you, Bennett. That's all, Commissioner. Mr. Fitz, anyone? Yes, sir, thank you. Mr. Davis. Yes, I do have uh, some questions and a couple of comments. Mr. Yes. Porter, the amount in 2023 that we allocated to ourselves to pay into the stop loss fund, how much did we pay into that? What was our, what did we charge ourselves as a premium, if you recall? I'm, I would have to get back to you with the exact figure, but I think it's somewhere around six hundred thousand, somewhere in that range. Maybe a little more. I'll get you the exact figure. What if if the I don't know, thought it's the right word, but if the savings was four hundred and sixty four thousand dollars, I was imagining the premium was substantially higher than that. We that's one of the advantages of the program is we can we we ourselves don't have to add in a lot extra that we would normally have to pay to a carrier we can really go with our actuarial analysis and keep that it's a savings on the front end and savings on the back end then you just comment for my president assuming Unico some entity that would join that stop loss opportunity that we talked about earlier today. Let's just call their premium $500,000 for purposes of discussion. If there's five points on the administrative fee, that's 25 grand. If there's four or five points being earned on interest, that's another 20 or 25 grand on the 500. I don't know that much about the safe harbor discussion that we had today, but I can't imagine that's less than 10 points. So, as I'm looking at it, there's, there's potentially 20 points in play on 500, 25 and 25 and the 50 in the safe harbor. And I understand the safe harbor is not an actual revenue source. It's just an amount that you could expect the premium to exceed the stop loss on any given year. 
Um, I, I think this is potentially a game changer if you run it all the way to ground into the future in terms of what this could mean. And I just wanted to reiterate my sincere appreciation for Jeff and the vendors who came up with this concept, and I look forward to its implementation. Thank you. Right. Under under big business, I'd like to comment regarding uh, earmarks for one-time strategic community investment. Um, Kirby County got a pretty significant funds out of that, so seven hundred fifty million dollars uh, one-time investment. And then in the past, we, as Commissioner Davis, referred to the three C's: Cleveland. Columbus and Cincinnati generally gets the vast part of any funding that goes down. So in this particular case, well, I think somewhere around eight and a half million dollars Fairfield County got. And in addition to that, although it lies in Lucky County, but it's Buckeye Lake region, if you will, uh, eleven million dollars for a new pier, and that number is amazing. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. So all in all, you're close to $20 million. Uh, that's going to be seen from representatives and senators, uh, Jeff LeRae, uh, Kevin Veller, and Senator Schaefer. I want to congratulate them on their good work. You know, the Senate completed yet because it has to be finalized with the Senate and the governor, which I think will be. But again, I'm just very excited about that. And there's Maybe some additional items coming in the capital budget for very nice. So uh, remains to be seen. Mission, mission fix. No, thank you. Mr. Davis. Yeah, just uh, on the, the capital budget issues, um, we've always felt pretty confident in the House. Um, and I'm just going to share my conversations with Senator Dolan. I now also feel confident in the Senate. So I, I think we're going to be in really good shape. The other thing I wanted to mention is um, 14 years of county commissioner, the history in these kinds of situations is that if, if we get a little scraps, three, four hundred grand or something out of a capital process, we're feeling like, oh, we got something. Um, Fairfield County being in the, the many, many millions um, is an extraordinary change in circumstance for us. We never seen anything like that before and may never again. Uh, but for the moment in the day, uh, sincere appreciation to all of our legislators uh, and look forward to a, a successful conclusion to that process and to the many benefits that our residents will see from that additional funding. Good morning. Uh, Bills out. We've received a lot of mail already. We have a lot of foot traffic folks coming in to pay in person. Um, yesterday morning, we got a call from Terry JFS at the drive through. And on the tax bill, it said that the drive through would be open starting this coming Monday. She said, People are here wanting to pay taxes. So we immediately shuffled and we, we staffed it. We got somebody down there to start taking the money. So we appreciate uh, her input letting us know what's going on. So uh, Second half collections underway. Very good. Anything from the engineer's office? Structure season's in full swing, so for us, so we're closing as many roads as we possibly can. And like I got stuck to today on the way here. Thank you very much. <laughs> That'd be a nice week to work out. So yeah, we've uh, gone over some of that with our folks, just talking about uh, heat stroke and heat exhaustion, uh, just taking it a little easier. Sure. Extra water, a little extra ice, and Gatorades and stuff. So. Absolutely. Uh, last week, I had the opportunity to attend the Hiring Court Association Summer Conference and uh, had some great discussions. And uh, we've got uh, Senate Bill 94 that we're trying to get through right now. And uh, so doing a lot of work with that and uh, trying to uh, hopefully succeed in in making that project work um, that would allow us to have a preservation fee 
um, added into our fee schedule so that when all of our documents go online and we lose that revenue, we can pick up that revenue source. Crazy thing is, is that the bill writes it from $1 to $5 and every county can decide discretionary what they want to add into their fees. So it'll be a little complicated for folks who travel from county to county to try and file, but um, it, it is a nice benefit to be able to recoup some of that loss um, that we will have once, once all of that is available to the public for free. Good work, Lucy. Dr. Brown. I just want to say congratulations to Crystal Walker, who is the Ace of Trades uh, this week. Um, she is the Board of Revision Appraisal Assistant. She does a tremendous job. She has tremendous organizational skills and was very excited to be featured there because she used to work for the Eagle Gazette uh, for 17 years and um, has a lot of friends that still are there as well. The Eagle Gazette also has been featuring the call center, which we're um, happy about because we want to have um, some knowledge about whether or not having those evening hours would be helpful. So we're using this as a test to see if that is helpful. Right now, one of the questions that we're getting a lot about is the Hunters Run Conservancy District. So the map of the month that is featured in the Eagle Gazette has been helpful because that flood in 1948, people think about 100 years that we all within their lifetime, this actually could happen again. So it's given some perspective to that. On Wednesday, I gave a presentation at the fairgrounds. There were about 50 people there and it was for the Ohio Public Employees Retired Group, and they were interested in what um, the county auditor functions are. We'll be participating in the Juneteenth celebration, which is at the gazebo downtown um, in Veterans Park from 11 to 1. And uh, looking forward to a, a good celebration there and hope that we have a good turnout. Good news is that Amanda Rollins had her baby, and that's Cole Sanford Rollins. Mom and baby are doing well. Very um, wonderful celebration to welcome that baby. Today, as the um, Freedom Isn't Free presentation was going on, I thought about perhaps something that y'all might have interest in. The Veterans Memorial National Monument and the presentation there, the exhibit there, is now the Ghost Army from World War II. And it's a bit of history that a lot of people don't know about. It's it's tremendous exhibit. It's very interesting. It only costs twenty dollars for a family pass that includes parking. And you may or may not know that Bill Blast, the designer, was a member of this Ghost Army, and they have his sketchbooks and other parts there too. So I mentioned that. It's quite interesting. I enjoyed seeing it. Thank you, Tony. You know. Probably don't have much more to say, but you know, just, you, thank, thank you. you for recognizing Ted. So again, you know, thank you for your forward thinking. I, you know, continue to do so. That's the, you know, that's what Fairfield County is all about. Not status quo, right? Um, Sorry again for the issues for, for those who suffered a little bit yesterday. Looked to be okay and back online. It was a technology issue, not a mechanical issue. And this is program being just the did the storm have anything to do with the drive? Well, actually, the my leading theory is there was a power surge on Sunday, so not related to the storm, but um, power surges can impact sensitive electronics. I, I know all about power surges. Mr. President, if I yeah, might, please. So, John, I mentioned to Anna, and I wanted to mention to you as well. Um, there's another pot full of money at the state, 50 million being allocated to jails or jail related expenditures. Um, I don't think that's officially passed yet, but it's going to. Uh, the One of the criteria as the legislation is currently drafted is need. You have to need it, which going to be hard for us, I think, to, to qualify in that regard. But I did wonder if you could at least peruse that legislation when passed with an eye on both the fencing project and uh, some of the IT <laughs> discussions that we've recently had 
to see if either or both of those uh, might be eligible, at least to be applied for, even though if the first level criteria is need, we may may get knocked out, but maybe we take a shot. I'm just asking you to look at it. Yeah. Is there a bill number attached? Yes, there is. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, last week we had our older abuse awareness breakfast of the for delivering the proclamation for that event. We're attending as well. It's Bart has appreciate everybody's support. And Jan Stout was uh, recognized as the furniture service and recognized as the partner of the year at that event. So. Very good, event, by the way. Thank you, President. All right, uh, please rise if you're able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Bennett, any announcements? There's one announcement. County offices will be closed tomorrow, Wednesday, June 19th, in observance of the Juneteenth holiday. That is it. Approval of minutes for uh, June 11th, uh, 2024. So moved. Second. Discussion? Being done, roll, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Minutes pass 3 0. From Fairfield County Emergency Management Agency, Resolution 2024 06.18.A. A resolution authorizing the approval of an advance from the general fund to EMA fund 2708 sub fund 8331 state homeland security grant program grant. So moved. Second. Discussion. Just happy to say this is another grant award for the uh, barrier systems that uh, were awarded. So the advance sets up our purchasing of that. And then these barriers prevent vehicles, traffic from populated areas that's the we have in the community. Um, how much did we for? Sorry, how much? Uh, the grant award was for 85,000. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolution passes 3-0. From the Fairfield County Engineering Resolution 2024-06.18.B, a resolution to approve the contract bid award for the 2024 microservicing project. In the Fairfield County Engineering, we have items B, C, D, E, and F. Second. Discussion. Uh, just awarding uh, the microservicing and the payment marketing <coughs> awards, and then also uh, the approval to do the repairs in the DMD subdivisions that we've been. The microservicing is a bit layer basket. It's a very, very thin, like, like just like it says, microservice. It's sand and asphalt just creates a, a waterproof barrier over top, allows us to extend the life of the pavement that way without going through the expense of a three inch overlay. Is that more expensive than the Chubb C? Uh, it is. It is more expensive. It's going to be a little bit thicker than chip and seal. It's just going to provide a little bit more surface wear, a little bit more life, a little bit more protection. So you get you a chip and seal micro. Like we do that too, yeah. yeah. Oh, instead of you saying, anytime we can do microsurface. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> to both yeah. additional discussion. Um, along that line, you may want to know we're probably going to chip seal Rainbow Drive this year, so that's going to create some fun calls. Send them my way. Wind Drive? Rainbow Rain Drive. So it's, oh, yeah. It's, it's a curb and gutter. We've got plans together to do those repairs and retain all that, but the budget does not allow it yet this year. So. Well, very good. Send them good. my way. Additional discussion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolutions passed 3-0.
from Fairfield County Facilities, Resolution 2024-06.18.G, a resolution authorizing the approval of a lease agreement with New Horizons Mental Health Services for the Fairfield Center. So moved. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolution passes 3-0. From the Fairfield County Family and Children First Council, Resolution 2024-06.18.H, a resolution authorizing the approval of partial repayment of an advance to the general fund from fund number 7521, Family, Adult, and Children First Council. Under um, Fairfield County Family and Children First Council, and the items H, I, J, and K. Second. Thanks, Josh and Tiffany. We always love partial repayments. Thank you. Additional discussion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolutions passed 3 0. From Fairfield County Job and Family Services, Resolution 2024 06.18.L. A resolution regarding a grant agreement between Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption and Fairfield County Job and Family Services, the Protective Services Department. Under Fairfield County Job and Family Services, I move items L, M, and N. Second. Discussion. Being done, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolutions passed 3 0. From Fairfield County Utilities, Resolution 2024-06.18.0, a resolution establishing discounted water and sewer rate pilot program for customers. So moved. Second. Discussion. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolution passes 3-0. For the payment of bills, resolution 2024-06.18.p, a resolution authorizing the approval of payment of invoices for departments that need Board of Commissioners approval. So moved. Second. Discussion. Please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Resolution passes 3-0. The next regular meeting is scheduled for June 25, 2024 at 9 a.m. Any additional item coming for the Board of Commissioners at this time? If I might, Mr. President, please. Tony, you might have mentioned this in your earlier remarks, and I might have not heard it. With the Commission looking favorably upon the, I'll just call it the Seniors Program, whatever you're calling it, it's fine too. SABA, S A B A. Seniors Program. <laughs> uh, when, when was that? When does that start? July first. And so, in terms of someone actually applying, getting approved, and then realizing the benefit, they'll need to use some water or sewer or something in July, get an August bill, and that's when they would first see <laughs> the difference between what they were paying and what they're paying under this program. Is that fair? In a sense, yes. It's not fully correct, I get from your body language. Well, they could have a bill that, that we end up putting it on that they have received. So we're going to start at July 1st, but um, we send out bills July 15th, so they could have used the water already in June. I see what you're saying. So, so June water, for example, would get billed under the new rate. They would get the 10% discount, yes. Yeah. All right, I follow you. The other thing, if I might, Mr. President, is the two issues today that, that I, I just very excited about is the, the program that, that Tony's brought to our attention here. I'm, I think that's a really neat thing. And I understand the stop loss things in the weeds and people's eyes blaze over when you get down that far in the rabbit hole, but that thing's huge. That concept is potentially very, very significant fiscally into the future of the county. And I am very thankful for Jeff and the outside folks that brought that to our attention. Thank you, Mr. President. Any additional comments at this time? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.